Hop on! I've prepared a tour around Earth's fellow planets. Let's start with Mercury, the smallest planet in the solar system. During the day, the temperature on the surface of this planet can reach 800 degrees Fahrenheit, and during the night, it can drop to negative 290 degrees Fahrenheit. The temperatures here are so extreme because the planet has no atmosphere. Instead of it, Mercury has a thin exosphere. That's one of the reasons why Mercury is not habitable. The temperatures and solar radiation are too extreme for any organism to survive there. Now let's imagine there's a way to live on Mercury. Then what would life there look like? Mercury's surface resembles that of the moon. Over time, meteorites left lots of marks on it. Unlike the moon's surface, Mercury is grayish brown. Now look up. The sun on Mercury would appear almost three times as large as it does on Earth. The sunlight would be almost seven times brighter. I wonder what type of sunglasses people would wear if we lived there. Can life appear on this planet in the future? Don't get your hopes up, it's very unlikely. Now, how about landing on Venus? You might think the hottest planet in our solar system is Mercury since it's the closest to the sun. But in reality, this title goes to Venus. What is it that makes Venus boil? The biggest reason is its atmosphere. It's made up almost entirely of carbon dioxide. The atmosphere is so thick that it leads to the planet warming up non-stop. Basically, the gases in the atmosphere prevent thermal radiation from leaving Venus. So, the planet simply can't cool down. The water on its surface constantly turns into vapor. If the surface of Venus was food, then its atmosphere would be the microwave. That's why the temperatures in this world can go up to 870 degrees Fahrenheit. What would it be like to live on Venus? On Earth, seasons change because of the planet's tilt, but Venus doesn't experience any significant changes throughout the year. Things are pretty constant at night and during the day too. And what about the view of the sky? The clouds on Venus appear yellow or bright white. They're mostly made of poisonous sulfuric acid, but then why does Venus appear reddish orange when you look at it from Earth? Talking about the true colors of planets can be a tricky business. The hue of a space body might be different when you look at it from another planet. If we traveled all the way to Venus, a reddish brown surface would welcome us. The molecules of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid block sunlight coming into Venus's surface, hence the reddish orange color of the planet. Oh, and did you know that Venus is often called Earth's twin? Both planets are nearly equal in size. Both have relatively young surfaces and thick atmospheres with clouds. Plus, the orbit of Venus is also the closest to Earth. That might raise a question about the possibility of life on Venus. I'm sorry to break the news, but no. Nope. Venus is not habitable. The next destination is Mars. Unlike Venus, Mars has seasons due to the planet's tilt on its axis. It also has a secondary seasonal effect caused by its highly elliptical orbit. The southern hemisphere has colder winters and hotter summers than those in the northern hemisphere. The average temperature on Mars is negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. But temperatures can also range from the poles to the equator, and they can change very dramatically within a single week. Still. Not that bad compared to the previous two planets, huh? Is Mars habitable? The number one thing a living organism should worry about here is space radiation. Earth has a magnetic field and a thick atmosphere to protect its surface from radiation. Mars has neither. The planet's gravity is one-third of Earth's. So, weaker gravity and a thinner atmosphere make it harder for any living being to survive on the red planet. In 2013, NASA reported an ancient freshwater lake that could have been a hospitable environment for microbial life. This is evidence now that liquid water once flowed on Mars. This confirmation suggests that Mars could have had the necessary environment to support life. But what happened to the water on Mars? The most popular explanation is that the planet's atmosphere became too thin and cold to keep liquid water on Mars's surface. The disappearance of water might also be related to the loss of early magnetic fields. Or the reason might be the red planet's size. Mars is probably too small to keep water. So for now, Mars is not habitable. But you know scientists keep sending missions to Mars. Maybe they'll find some new information. Let's wait and see. Now Jupiter. Have you ever wondered what it might be like to live on the biggest planet in our solar system? 
Jupiter's environment is an unlikely place to support life. The temperatures on this planet and its composition are too extreme for any organisms to appear there. Jupiter has layers of gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. These gases fill the entire planet. Quite literally, there is no solid surface on the planet. Gases go all the way to the core, below the surface. They become liquid and turn into plasma because the atmospheric pressure there is way more intense than any place on Earth. To put it into perspective, an organism on Jupiter has to resist 1,000 times more atmospheric pressure than it would on Earth. Can a living being survive in such conditions? Unlikely. Jupiter is completely uninhabitable. But hey, have you heard that its moon Europa might be a possible habitable zone? Change of scenery. Saturn. It's the second largest planet in our solar system. Like Jupiter, Saturn is a gas giant ball, mainly consisting of hydrogen and helium. What about temperatures on Saturn? It's freezing. Plus, there are extremely powerful winds there. The winds in Saturn's upper atmosphere reach the speed of 1,600 feet per second. Let's compare them to storms on Earth to have a better understanding. The strongest hurricane ever recorded on Earth was moving at 350 feet per second. So the answer to the question, is there life on Saturn? Seems pretty obvious. Life as we understand it doesn't exist there. The next stop is Uranus, one of the largest ice giants. Uranus's atmosphere is dominated by ice, but it's not the only reason that causes the planet's blue color. It's also the methane in the atmosphere. It absorbs red light and reflects blue. The same goes for Neptune. Uranus is the coldest planet in the solar system. The temperatures there can be as low as negative 371 degrees Fahrenheit. Life on Earth needs sunlight to get energy, but there's nothing on Uranus that can produce any energy for life forms to thrive. The bottom line is Uranus doesn't have the environment to sustain life. Heading for Neptune, the second ice giant. What is there on the planet furthest from the sun? Obviously, it's incredibly chilly. There's neither a source of energy that bacterial life can exploit, nor a source of liquid water. Currently, scientists believe it's unlikely to find life on Neptune because of such unfriendly conditions. So, what makes our planet so livable? And I'm not just talking about human life, I mean any living organisms, even microbes. Life requires very special conditions to exist. All living beings need some sort of food, water, and the right temperature to develop. The atmosphere is a vital element. Humans, for instance, need oxygen to breathe, and they can only survive in temperatures that aren't extremely hot or cold. Another thing is gravity. All the other planets I've mentioned don't have exactly the same conditions as Earth. Life there would probably be different than what we have here. All living beings on Earth have adapted to our atmosphere, and life forms elsewhere would need to be able to survive in that planet's conditions. The planet races through space. Its orbit is unstable, like a pool ball gliding across the table looking for a target to collide into. Only this ball is the size of Mars, and it's going 9,000 miles per hour. Boom! It crashes into another planet. This Mars-sized object was called Thea, and what it smashed into was Earth. The impact released 100 million times more energy than the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. The planetary collision threw tons of solid material from both objects out into space. But only one of the bodies survived. Thea was obliterated and then swallowed entirely by early Earth. But that debris didn't go flying endlessly into the cosmic void. No, something crucial happened. All those solid chunks gathered into a cloud. Gravity squished it together, pressing more and more. And in the end, our moon was born. So goes the theory. At the time of the impact, the solar system was just forming. And this rendezvous of epic proportions probably wouldn't have happened if it weren't for a newly formed Jupiter throwing Thea off its orbit and straight into Earth. Our young planet withstood the blow. Time passed. Earth evolved. Its surface will become unrecognizable over the next 4.5 billion years. It's hard for the human mind to understand this vast amount of time. 
So we'll squeeze it all into one day. If midnight is when Earth first formed from gas and dust that remained after the Sun's creation, the next four hours show a lifeless planet. Red hot, covered in lava, constantly bombarded by asteroids and, as you know by now, even a whole other planet. Yet life finds a way. The first cells appear. It's 4 a.m. on the clock. At 2.08 p.m., we see the first single-celled organisms form. It's not until 8.28 p.m. that sea plants appear. 20 minutes later, what's this? Jellyfish. After them, the planet flourishes with different fish, reptiles, insects. The forests grow at 10.30 p.m. Between 10.56 and 11.40, dinosaurs roamed the Earth. The giant lizards ruled our planet for less than one hour. A minute before the dinosaur's extinction at 11.39 p.m., the first mammals begin to run around the planet. At 11.58 and 43 seconds, humans appear. In the cosmic scale of things, we've only ruled this planet for 1 minute and 17 seconds. So here's the main question baffling scientists. Why didn't life on Earth ever stop? It had every chance to cease. Why didn't our planet become like Venus or Mars? They both once had an atmosphere and oceans. Today, they're lifeless deserts. Forget about complex scientific concepts and theories of the universe's structure. Our little rock and all its inhabitants are just incredibly lucky. Professor Toby Tyrell at the University of Southampton used computer programs and climate simulations to solve the puzzle of why asteroid collisions in ice ages didn't turn our little rock into a lifeless wasteland. The research team took not 10, 100, or 1,000 virtual planets similar to Earth. They used 100,000 for the experiment. And every single one of those 100,000 were simulated a hundred times. They exposed these virtual planets to different phenomena. They were bombarded by asteroids, frozen, exposed to epic eruptions of supervolcanoes that blacken the skies and block the surface from the sun's rays. Just 9%, or 8,700 of them, were successful one time in 100 simulations. Of that group, 4,500 planets remain inhabited 10 times. Only on one planet out of 100,000, life didn't stop all 100 times. If life is a lottery, Earth got extremely lucky. In 2009, the unique Kepler telescope was launched into space. Its task? Search one patch of the night sky, or 150,000 stars, for rocky Earth-like planets. Over nine years in service, it ended up surveying more than 500,000 stars. In all that time, with all those observations over nearly a decade, Kepler discovered 2,600 possible Earth-like planets. The weird thing is, most of them are a type you can't find in our own solar system. There's something between the size of Earth and Neptune. But back to the real Earth. If you go far from the city and look up at the sky, you'll see an ocean of stars. If you're lucky and it's a clear night, with an unaided eye, you could count a maximum of 2,500 points of light. Yet, there are at least 100 billion stars in the Milky Way. Some estimates put the numbers of stars in the Milky Way up to 400 billion. So where's this giant range coming from? Well, counting stars isn't exactly an easy job. Scientists obviously don't number each one individually – one, two, three, and so on. You know how long it takes to count just one billion? Over a hundred years. Now multiply that by 400. Instead, they look at small patches of space and use some complex scientific formulas to make educated guesses of how many stars there are in total. You can do a similar experiment yourself. Imagine a bucket filled with 10 pounds of rock, sand, soil, and other items. Your job? Understand how many rocks are in that mix. We'll count only those rocks that are visible to us from above. Get a rough estimate of their volume and weight, what percentage of the total we can see, and with some calculation, you can get a number. Is it exact? Nah. Why? Because you can't know if the rocks in the bucket are spread evenly throughout. 
Or if they're all about the same size throughout? What if the ones at the bottom, if there are any, are bigger or smaller than your sample view? They could have completely different weights and volumes. That bucket is our Milky Way galaxy, and the rocks you are counting are stars. The point? Scientists can't know for sure how many stars there really are. Maybe 100 billion? Or perhaps four times that. Of those, 4 billion are like our Sun. With our own galaxy, the most accepted estimate for planets that could potentially support life is 300 million. Though, as the tradition of scientific inexactness goes, that number could be up to 5 billion or more. Either way, lots of real estate to choose from. And that's just the Milky Way. But get this, it's just one of 200 billion galaxies in the observable universe. The most recent research puts that number 10 times higher, something like trillions of galaxies in space. And we've only studied less than 10% of them. As for how many stars there are in the universe, scientists put it at 1 septillion. That's 1 followed by 24 zeros. Again, it's all estimates because we can't know for sure. So far, one thing is clear. Our Earth is the only place in the universe that we know of where there's life. And this planet has done everything it can to change that. Over the past 540 million years, more than 20 major extinction events have occurred. The last one was 66 million years ago. Yep, it was the one that took out the dinosaurs, and 75% of all life on this planet, for that matter. An object 7 miles across in diameter smashed into our planet. It was going 120 times faster than the fastest car today. Over 900,000 miles all around the impact site, everything caught fire. A huge tsunami swept across the world's oceans. Billions of tons of dust and sulfur rose into the sky and blocked the sun's warm rays. A global cooling came to Earth. A little over 200 million years ago, there was a lesser-known extinction event that wiped out half of all life on the planet. Most likely volcanoes or an asteroid strike are to blame. Other theories say the movement of tectonic plates triggered another ice age. At that time, huge crocodiles ruled the Earth. They disappeared, and new animals entered the arena of history – dinosaurs. But the worst this planet has ever seen was the Permian-Triassic event about 250 million years ago. 80% of marine life, 70% of land animals and plants – all gone. Volcanoes spewed out a colossal amount of lava where modern-day Siberia is. But it affected the entire planet. Around 445 million years ago, the dominant life form on our planet was marine invertebrates. There was only one continent, Gondwana, and plants were just starting to flourish on land. But something happened that took out 75 to 85 percent of all living organisms. It could have been an ice age, rising temperatures, or a more daring theory. Some think it could have been a huge star exploding 6,000 light years from Earth. It launched a jet-like gamma-ray burst that ripped across space, and poor little Earth happened to be in its path. It burned off the ozone layer instantly. Yeah, we kind of need that thing to protect us. Case in point, no matter how much this planet, or even the universe, tries to wipe out life on Earth, which is here in the first place from unbelievable odds, life always finds a way. For decades now, scientists have been discovering new planets outside our solar system. By 2023, we've found more than 5,000 of them, and many of these exoplanets could potentially even have life. Now, if you're ready for a wild ride through space, let's find out what potentially habitable planets we've discovered in the last few years. LP890-9b and LP890-9c Buckle up, because we're heading to LP890-9, a red dwarf star located a whopping 105 light years away from Earth. This star is quite cool compared to our Sun, in terms of temperature, of course. 
It has a temperature of about 4,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, this little guy may be small, but it's packed with surprises. For example, two exoplanets orbiting around it. Moreover, both of these planets are likely terrestrial, meaning they are rocky, just like Earth. First up, we have LP90-9b, which was discovered in 2022 using the TESS telescope and later confirmed by the Speculus telescope. This planet is a super-Earth, weighing in at about 13 times the mass of our own planet. It's also slightly bigger than Earth, with a radius about 1.3 times larger. And if you thought Mercury's orbit around the Sun was quick, just wait until you hear about LP890-9b. It takes about three days to complete one lap around its star. Imagine falling asleep in freezing winter and waking up in hot summer. But the real showstopper here is LP890-9c. This one was discovered by the Speculus Telescope. It's a bit further out from the star and takes a leisurely 2.5 times longer to orbit than LP890-9b. It's also a bit larger than Earth. But its real claim to fame is its location within the habitable zone of its star. That means it could potentially have liquid water on its surface and a climate suitable for life. Now this planet becomes a prime candidate for studying its atmosphere using the James Webb Space Telescope. But hold on, it's not all sunshine and rainbows for LP890-9c. It's also really close to its star meaning it's full of radiation that could potentially make it less habitable. And to top it off, it's tidally locked, just like our moon. That means one side of the planet is always facing the star and is incredibly hot, while the other is always in the dark and really cold. Scientific models suggest that this planet could be more like Venus in terms of its atmosphere and climate. And Venus is, you know, isn't known for being human friendly. But despite these challenges, LP890-9c is still a fascinating exoplanet worth studying further. Who knows what secrets it may hold? Let's move on to the next candidates. GJ1002b and GJ1002c An international team of scientists led by researchers at the Instituto de Astrofisica de Canarias has found two Earth-like planets just 16 light-years away from our solar system. They both orbit a red dwarf star called GJ1002. Our Sun is a yellow dwarf, which means that GJ1002 is much cooler and fainter than our own Sun. But that's okay. Both planets are very close to its star, so it shouldn't be too cold or dark on them. These planets, called GJ1002b and GJ1002c, are both in the habitability zone of their star, meaning they could potentially support life. Also, both of them have masses similar to that of Earth. GJ1002b is the inner planet and takes about 10 days to orbit its star, while GJ1002c takes a little over 21 days. These planets are great candidates for studying their atmospheres and could even be targets for future missions to search for signs of life. The most important thing is that these two planets could potentially support life, and that's pretty cool. Plus, the fact that they're located so close to us means that we might be able to visit them someday. Well, maybe not us personally, but you know. And maybe one day, we'll even find some extraterrestrial life on one of these planets. Now that would be out of this world, but moving on to the next one. Kepler-1649c Kepler-1649c, also known as the Lost Exoplanet, was rediscovered in 2022 by scientists using data from NASA's Kepler spacecraft. This exoplanet is located about 300 light-years away from Earth and orbits a small, cool star called Kepler-1649. It's about the same size as Earth, and just like the previous ones, it's located in the habitable zone of its star. Initially, the data about this planet was discarded. A special computer program called RoboVetter, written to automatically sift through the volumes of Kepler data, labeled this candidate as a false positive. In other words, the program thought it was just some kind of an error or interference. Fortunately, the researchers double-checked such things, 
and when rechecking the data, they managed to rescue poor Kepler 1649c. Now we know that this is a terrestrial planet just like Earth. And if it really does contain water, there could even be life there. But don't pack your bags just yet. There are still many unknowns about Kepler 1649c. For example, we don't know what its atmosphere is like or what kind of surface it has. It's also possible that the planet is tidally locked, just like LP 890-9c. That would be, uh, unpleasant. That's why Kepler 1649c is definitely worth further study. Maybe it turns out to be a perfect place for us to set up a vacation home in the future. Just make sure to bring plenty of sunscreen since the planet is pretty close to its star and things could get pretty toasty. Kepler 1638b. This exoplanet is located about 5,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. It's also located in the habitable zone of its star. It was discovered in 2020 by the Kepler spacecraft through the process called transiting. They basically take a bunch of photos of the star at different times. After that, the programs analyze these photos and look for small spots and dots on them. These tiny dips in brightness may mean that a planet was passing by the star. Kepler 1638b is a bit of an oddball compared to most exoplanets we've found so far. It's about four times the mass of Earth and has a radius about two times that of Earth, making it a super-Earth exoplanet. Its orbital period is about 260 days, which is quite close to our Earth, and that's great. Finally, at least somewhere, winter and summer will flow normally. Kepler 1638b could have some liquid water there. That's why it's also a good candidate for further study, to see if it could potentially support life. Let's hope that we'll find out more about this planet in the future. And finally, the last one. Kepler 438b. Kepler 438b is an exoplanet located approximately 640 light years away from Earth in the constellation Lyra. It was discovered in 2015 by the Kepler Space Telescope. One of the most interesting things about Kepler 438b is its size and location. It's about the same size as Earth and also orbits within the habitable zone of its star. But there are a few catches. For one, Kepler 438b orbits around a red dwarf star, which are known for their high levels of solar radiation and flare-ups. This could make the surface of the planet too hostile for life as we know it. In addition, Kepler 438b has a much shorter year, only around 35 Earth days long. This could lead to extreme temperature fluctuations on the planet's surface, but maybe it's home to some hardy extraterrestrial life forms that have adapted to its unique conditions, or maybe not. Either way, it's definitely worth keeping an eye on. This is a small list of exoplanets that we've discovered in recent years. Now, with the use of new technologies, we'll be able to find new exoplanets much more often. Let's hope that at least a few of them will really be inhabited. The only life that we are certain about so far in the entire universe is on planet Earth. Whether that life is intelligent is, let's say, arguable. But anyway, it's not surprising that we're tirelessly searching for life on other planets. So far, they've discovered more than 4,000 of them. But what's even cooler? NASA has compiled a new list of 24 planets that aren't just Earth-like, they're better. The conditions on them are so good that they're more comfortable than on our planet. So let's examine some of them. KOI 5715.01 Hmm, let's be coy, shall we? <laughs> this wonderful planet is in the constellation Cygnus. And why is it so wonderful? Well, our sun is a yellow dwarf. And sorry sun, even though you're not bad at supporting life, there are some stars that can do it better. Nothing personal. The planet Koi 5715.01 orbits near an orange dwarf. Orange dwarfs are stars slightly smaller than our sun and have a little lower luminosity. Uh, did you like the alliteration there? Anyway, don't worry, it doesn't mean we're going to live in complete darkness. In fact, if the planet is found closer to the sun and it has a thicker atmosphere, it may even be lighter and more colorful than on Earth. Now, our sun has a very short lifespan. 
Right now, it has 7 to 8 billion years left to live, a little longer than Earth's age. But orange dwarfs can live from 45 to 70 billion years. This is great not only because we'll be able to hang out on this planet longer, but also because the planets around these stars have more time to form life. Now, ideally, we would need to find a planet next to an orange dwarf that is about 7 billion years old. It's very likely there will be at least some organisms there. Koi 571501 is about 5.5 billion years old. Yeah, it may not seem mature enough, but that's okay, neither do I. Our Earth is a billion years younger, and that didn't stop us. The planet is quite close to its star and is in a habitable zone. One year there lasts 190 days. Imagine going to elementary school and already getting a driver's license. <laughs> it's almost two times larger than the Earth. The average temperature there is 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which is slightly less than ours, 57. But it mostly feels warmer there because strong gravity helps it hold on to heat in the atmosphere longer. It's a little too far away though, like 3,000 light years from Earth which is about 18 quadrillion miles. Yep, better bring a really big lunch with you. Koi 3010.01 This planet is found next to the star Koi 2010. This planet sounds like a very pleasant world. The average temperature on this planet is 67 degrees, so a little warmer than ours. But that's a good thing. Scientists believe that on a perfect planet, the temperature should be just about 10 degrees hotter than on Earth. The more heat there is on the planet, the more comfortable it is to live there. Also the higher chances of developing life. The radius of this planet is nearly one and a half times larger than Earth. There's some atmosphere, although we're not yet sure about its composition. But it's probably like the Earth's. Scientists think that we'll find an ocean there, and it can cover up to 60% of the surface, which is also cool. In a perfect world, water and land should be distributed more evenly than on our planet. A little more land means a little more territory and resources, right? But listen, this planet is actually very similar to the Earth. The semblance is so striking that scientists believe we have an 84% chance to find life there. Of course, not necessarily an intelligent life, but at least some animals. Wouldn't that be cool? Now, what do you think they could look like? Hmm, very Earth-like planet, but with stronger gravity. Well, if someone lives there, they're probably big but have a small height and strong little legs. Sounds adorable and scary. But we won't be able to find out the truth anytime soon. So far, for us, these planets are microscopic dots in space. We only have some dry, boring data about them and don't even know what they look like. We'll have to wait until we can find a way to get closer to these planets. Kepler 186f This is also one of the best candidates for having life. This rather cute planet was nicknamed the Earth's cousin because it does have a strong resemblance. Anyway, these two planets are like sisters, not twins. Kepler 186f rotates near a red dwarf. Red dwarfs are stars even dimmer and smaller than orange dwarfs. Yeah, they'll also live for a very, very long time, but their luminosity is also quite low. However, Kepler-186f is closer to its star than we're to our sun, so it shouldn't be too dark there. Well, at least not night-like dark. The sky on this planet is sure to be an unusual shade of red, like sunsets on Earth. What do you think? Would you like to live on a planet with an eternal sunset? The size of this planet is about the same as Earth. Not bad, not perfect. Why so? Because the coolest planets are those that are bigger than Earth and have stronger gravity. Now you'll probably say, but wouldn't it be harder to walk there and even harder to get out of bed on Monday? <laughs> of course! But on the other hand, this planet will pull the atmosphere better. The atmosphere will be thicker and denser. This means more protection from the scary space stuff, more oxygen, and more heat. Not to mention the fact that the bigger planets have more space to settle. Awesome, right? But of course, the Earth's size is also an excellent choice. Another cool fact is that the tilt of Kepler-186f is about the same as ours. It means that there should be stable seasons and a normal day-night cycle. Do you know how important the tilt of the planet is? Let's look at Mars. Mars is also, in fact, found in the habitable zone of our Sun. 
but its tilt is very unstable, and as a result, the entire ocean that could have been on it once now completely dried up. Today, it's just a red desert, and there's no life there. At least not as far as we know. But you see how important these tiny details are? This planet is also quite far away from us, 490 light years. That's about 3 quadrillion miles. So yeah, we're just going to keep waiting for intergalactic travel. Kepler 62e and 62f These planets were called the most Earth-like before we discovered Kepler 186f. They're very comparable to our home. Kepler 62e is about one and a half times larger than Earth, and Kepler 62f is just slightly smaller than that. They're located in the constellation Lyra, which is about 1200 light years away from us. They both also orbit a red dwarf. One year on Kepler 62e lasts about 122 days, even less than on that first planet we talked about. Scientists believe that both 62e and 62f are sort of water worlds. Warm places mostly, or even completely covered with water. If there is land there, it's probably just some islands. Hmm, a world consisting entirely of islands. A fantasy dream for some, think Hawaii. And a nightmare for others, think Megalodon. But if you're a fan of ancient marine animals, just imagine how gigantic they could be there. Still, there are many things we don't know about this planet. Does it have a surface? What about its composition, density? One day, maybe we'll be able to answer these questions. And so, that's it for the super-Earths. Of course, the original list is much longer, and you can go check it out on the internet. Now, the best thing about all this is that these are planets that are better than the Earth. But we also know thousands of other exoplanets that are just close enough to ours. And the odds are, a few of them have at least some form of life. But they're very, very far away, so we have no way to check it out right now. Perhaps, down the road, we'll find some cool creatures on many of them. Let's cut the Earth in half. You can see all of its layers. Here's the inner core. It's about 40 times hotter than the inside of your oven. That's the mantle, an ocean of hot lava. Here comes the crust of the Earth the solid surface on which our civilization lives. But if you look up, there are many layers besides the atmosphere and the ozone layer. Scientists recently discovered a strange bubble here, which protects our planet from radiation. And nope, it's not the Earth's magnetic field. This bubble is made of radio waves. Our planet grows like a Christmas tree in the radio spectrum. But we're interested in low-frequency waves, the ones that let us keep in touch with submarines. So, radio waves are like light waves, or regular ocean waves. Look at this one. The distance between the two peaks is the wavelength, and the number of these waves over a period of time is the frequency. For example, there are 10 waves in this interval of one second. So, can you guess the frequency of this wave? Yep, it's 10 hertz. Cell phones use waves with a frequency of 300 to 3000 megahertz. So, add six more zeros to that number. But waves of that frequency don't penetrate barriers well. Think of how you lose your cell phone connection when you're driving through a tunnel. That's because there is metal inside. It's a conductive material that weakens the radio waves a lot. Salt water is also a kind of conductor. So if the submarine is deep enough, the thick layer of water weakens the signal. And we lose communication. To maintain it, we send fewer waves but make them longer. In the same amount of time, the frequency of the short waves will be much higher than the frequency of the long waves. That's why they're called very low frequency waves. But as it turns out, these waves travel all over the Earth and even into space. This is where things get interesting. The waves collide with particles of radiation from the sun. We think of the sun as a friendly giant giving us light and heat, but it actually emits a lot of harmful radiation. Each flare, or the electrical discharge of material on our home star, causes an even greater burst of radiation. These particles fly to our planet, just as radio waves do. They travel 93 million miles from the sun to Earth in 8 minutes and crash into our bubble, which acts as a shield. Basically, radiation particles from the sun accumulate in the radiation belts around the Earth. Our planet's magnetic field traps them, and a recently discovered bubble of very low frequency waves lies right below this radiation belt. It helps us repel some of the harmful emissions. 
analysis of old studies confirmed that the radiation belts used to be much lower and closer to Earth. But when our civilization began to use radio actively, our waves raised that belt higher. No one expected such an effect from simple radio waves, but it'll give us a way to protect astronauts in the future. When you're on Earth, its magnetic field keeps you safe from radiation. You can physically see it when charged solar wind particles make the air particles at the poles of our planet glow. This is an aurora. Next time you admire this beauty, know that it's actually the Earth saving you from some extremely harmful rays. But if you're outside the Earth's magnetic field, somewhere in space, I have bad news for you. Nothing protects you there. This is a big problem for astronauts who spend months on the International Space Station. Perhaps scientists will learn to create protective bubbles of very low frequency waves around space stations and spacecraft. The same is true for other planets. We're probably going to colonize Mars. There is no magnetic field there and nothing can protect you from radiation. But if you create an artificial bubble there, you can reduce the harmful radiation. Another invisible bubble protecting us is the atmosphere. It's like a layer cake or an onion. Each level of the atmosphere has its own properties. The lowest layer that we live in is the troposphere. This layer contains 80% of the weight of all the air on the planet. It's also the main place where water vapor lives. And this is where the machine called weather works. The sun sends rays of energy to the Earth. Our planet's surface reflects them and heats the air in the troposphere. This makes it move and change places with the cold air. So all the wind, cyclones, storms, and tornadoes only happen in the troposphere up to about 7.5 miles high. That's why commercial planes fly at an altitude of around 6 miles. The wind or other bad weather conditions hardly affect this area, and the air here is not as dense as it is down on Earth. Flying one mile above sea level is like moving through a biscuit. It's hard, but at a 6-mile altitude, flying feels like moving through light whipped cream. The plane almost feels no resistance, so it's a win-win. They save fuel and keep the passengers safe. A couple of significant downsides are that it's very cold and you can't breathe there. It's cold because there are very few air molecules to absorb heat from the ground and transfer it to each other. You wouldn't be able to breathe here for the same reason. That's why planes are equipped with oxygen masks, just in case. Let's go a little here. This is the stratosphere. There's even fewer air molecules up here, and that's where the weather probes fly. They're the kind of small balloons with computers people use to predict the weather. This part of the atmosphere also contains the well-known ozone layer. This is our shield against harmful ultraviolet radiation. Ozone is almost the same as oxygen, except it has three atoms in it. When harmful ultraviolet rays enter our atmosphere, they crash into the O3 molecule. The ray breaks the molecule into O2 and another oxygen atom. The ray itself is converted into heat but the ozone regenerates quickly. A single oxygen atom joins the O2, and the ozone molecule is ready to protect us again. It's the invisible shield that protects us from radiation. It gave birth to all life on Earth. As our civilization developed, we started to emit freon gas into the atmosphere. We used to fill our old refrigerators with it. A single chlorine atom would detach from a freon molecule when in the air and then it would bind a single oxygen atom. Now, the ozone can't regenerate like it used to. Fortunately, we banned the use of such harmful gases, and the ozone layer began to regenerate. Scientists expect it to fully recover in the middle of the 21st century. The stratosphere ends at about 31 miles. The next layer is the mesosphere, the coldest of them all. On average, it's about negative 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's five times colder than your freezer. This is the layer of the atmosphere where incoming meteors start to ignite because of friction in the air. Then, they will eventually burn up completely. The air here is too thin for airplanes or balloons to fly, but it's still too dense for satellites. So, this layer of the atmosphere is not well studied. The next layer extends from 55 miles above sea level to about 500. That's a little more than the distance between Las Vegas and San Francisco. Kármán line is situated in this layer of the atmosphere. This is the boundary between our planet and space. The thermosphere is where all our spacecraft and satellites fly. It's also home to the International Space Station. 
The temperature rises extremely. The air here is about 10 times hotter than your oven can produce. It's all due to solar activity. But you would never be able to feel this heat. The air molecules that carry the heat here are so small that you would literally float between them. Imagine a giant pool with only three drops of water. That's the thermosphere. And the highest layer of our atmosphere is the exosphere. This is the widest layer of our air bubble. Scientists believe its boundaries are about halfway to the moon at 120,000 miles. This is the point where the pressure of solar radiation begins to exceed the Earth's gravity. It's still part of our atmosphere. This means that astronauts who went on various space missions and have been on the ISS have actually never left the Earth's atmosphere. Mercury gets a bad rap for always being hot, but that's not entirely true. The planet's got no atmosphere, so its temperature swings are wild. When it's facing the sun, it can get up to a blistering 800 degree Fahrenheit, but when it's turned away, it drops to a frigid minus 290 degrees. The reason for this is that Earth has a cozy atmosphere that keeps our temps in check. Mercury doesn't have that luxury, so it's at the mercy of the sun's rays. But despite all that, Mercury's still worth checking out. It's close to the sun, which makes it a prime spot for studying how solar radiation affects planets. And even though it's not exactly hospitable to life, there are still plenty of mysteries to unravel. Venus is often referred to as the sister planet of Earth. Yeah, many people believe that it's this beautiful and lush planet, just like our home. But boy, are they wrong. In reality, Venus is a total diva. She's got this thick atmosphere that traps heat and causes surface temperatures to reach up to a scorching 864 degree Fahrenheit. I mean, I get it. Venus wants to stand out and be unique, but she's taken it to a whole new level. She's like that one friend who always has to one-up everyone else. Oh, you think Earth is cool? Well, I'm the only planet that spins clockwise? Beat that! But let's be real here. Venus is just trying too hard. She's got these crazy sulfuric acid clouds that rain down on her surface and make it impossible for anything to survive. It's like she's trying to keep all the attention for herself by making sure no other life forms can exist. And her atmosphere, it's so thick and heavy that it would crush us like a grape. So, yeah, Venus may look pretty from afar with her bright yellowish glow, but don't fall for that. She's a total drama queen who just can't handle sharing the spotlight with anyone else. Anyway, enough about Venus. Let's focus on the real star of the show, Earth. We may not have all the flashy features that Venus has, but at least we're hospitable and welcoming to all forms of life. Plus, we've got pizza. So who needs sulfuric acid clouds anyway? You may think that since we live on this planet, we know it from A to Z, and there is no room for any misconception. Alrighty, then tell me what shape is Earth? If you say it's round, sorry, but you're not right. So, our planet may look like a ball, but it isn't a perfect one. You see, because of the spinning action, the North and South Poles get squished a bit and they're sort of flat. The Earth's wobbling, and other stuff are actually causing it to change shape over time, but it's still roundish. Let's talk about Mars, the red planet that has fascinated humans for centuries. Now I know we all have this idea that Mars is this habitable planet that we can just pack our bags and move to if Earth becomes uninhabitable. Nope, that's not entirely true. One common misconception about Mars is that it has a breathable atmosphere. While Mars does have an atmosphere, it is much thinner than Earth's and consists mostly of carbon dioxide, making it unsuitable for human life without extensive life support systems. So if you're planning on taking a stroll on the surface of Mars, you better pack your oxygen tanks. But hey, that doesn't mean we should give up on our dreams of colonizing Mars. Who knows? Maybe in a few decades, we'll be able to call Mars our second home. Some people think Jupiter is a solid planet, but let me tell you, that's just a bunch of hot air. Literally. Jupiter is actually a gas giant made up mostly of hydrogen and helium. It's so massive that it doesn't even have a solid surface. I mean, I thought my bed was soft, but floating on a cloud of gas sounds pretty comfy too. Jupiter's atmosphere gradually transitions into its interior, which means it's like a never-ending party in there. Saturn's rings are one of the most fascinating features of the planet. So, 
A common misconception about Saturn is that its rings are solid. In reality, Saturn's rings are made up of countless small particles of ice and rock that orbit the planet. They stretch out over 174,000 miles from the planet's surface, but are only about 65 feet thick. The particles that make up the rings range in size from tiny specks of dust to large boulders. Scientists believe that the rings were formed from debris left over after the formation of Saturn and its moons. Over time, the particles were pulled in by Saturn's gravity and formed into the beautiful rings we see today. Saturn's rings also have some amazing features, such as gaps and divisions caused by the gravitational pull of nearby moons. There are also waves and spiral patterns that are created by the gravitational interactions between the particles in the rings. Despite their beauty, Saturn's rings are constantly changing. The particles collide with each other, creating new ones and breaking apart others. This means that the rings we see today may look very different in the future. So next time you look up at Saturn and its rings, remember that you're looking at a cosmic snow globe made up of billions of tiny particles floating around the planet. Now, one common misconception about Uranus is that it's a lazy dude who can't even rotate properly. People think it just rolls around on its side all day long, but let me tell you, that's not entirely true. Sure, Uranus does have a tilted axis of rotation, but it still manages to spin in the same direction as most other planets in our solar system. It's like that one friend who always shows up late to the party, but still manages to have a good time and fit in with the crowd. But let's be real, Uranus is still a bit of an oddball. It's the only planet in our solar system that rotates on its side to such a degree. But after all, variety is the spice of life, right? So cheers to Uranus, the planet that refuses to conform to anyone's expectations. Ugh, I wish I had the guts to be like this. Have you ever heard someone say that Neptune is just a blue version of Jupiter or Saturn? Well, let me tell you, that's like saying a banana is just a yellow version of a cucumber. It's not even close. Sure, Neptune and its gas giant buddies share some similarities, but Neptune stands out in the crowd with its beautiful blue hue. It's all thanks to the methane chilling in its atmosphere. By the way, did you know that it's the farthest planet from the Sun? It's so far out there that it takes almost 165 Earth years for it to complete one orbit around the Sun. Talk about taking your sweet time. And let's not forget about its 14 moons. That's right, Neptune has a whole entourage of moons following it around like groupies at a concert. Maybe they're hoping to catch a glimpse of Neptune's famous blue glow. So, next time someone tries to tell you that Neptune is just a knockoff version of Jupiter or Saturn, you can confidently correct them and say, excuse me, but Neptune is its own unique gas giant with a fancy blue vibe. Did you know that Pluto isn't actually considered a planet anymore? That's right, in 2006, the International Astronomical Union decided to reclassify Pluto as a dwarf planet. So what exactly does that mean? Well, a dwarf planet is a celestial body that orbits the Sun and is big enough to be rounded by its own gravity. But it hasn't cleared its orbit of other debris. It's a common misconception that Pluto is still considered a planet. But the truth is that it's just not big enough to make the cut. Sorry, Pluto. Don't worry, though. You may be small, but you're still loved by many. Plus, being a dwarf planet is pretty cool too. You get to hang out with other celestial misfits like Ceres and Haumea. So keep on orbiting, Pluto. We still think you're out of this world. Now we all know that all planets are round. There are no square ones so far, and that's because of gravity. Well, roundish at least, as not all of the planets have perfect proportions. But did you ever wonder about the shape of the universe itself? Is it also round because of the same forces? Well, not really. Based on what information we have so far, the universe is actually… flat? According to the principles of general relativity, space has the ability to curve. This opens the door for the universe to have three potential shapes a flat plane like a sheet of paper, a closed sphere like a bowl, or an open saddle-like curve. This isn't just a matter of academic interest, you know. The universe's shape has direct consequences on its ultimate destiny. One cosmologist from Princeton University explained it beautifully. 
The shape of the universe is a kind of map to its past and a predictor of its future. The questions of whether the universe will keep expanding forever or collapse at some point, and if it's finite or infinite, all circle back to the question of its shape. Now, to wrap your head around this cosmic question, you need to understand two key elements – the density of the universe and its rate of expansion. Let's dig into this a little. Around 68% of the universe is made up of dark energy, while 27% is dark matter. <laughs> the rest, which is normal matter, if you'd like, makes up the stars, planets, and other cosmic bodies we're familiar with. When we talk about the density of the universe, we're referring to the quantity of normal matter packed into a given volume of space. Now, if the universe is denser, it also has more gravity. In this case, the gravitational pull can overcome the force of expansion. So the universe curls up into a sphere. This shape is known as the closed model, where the universe ends up looking like a gigantic cosmic ball. Imagine a world that's finite but without boundaries. A contradiction for sure. In this model, an adventurous explorer could travel forever through space, never bumping into a wall or falling over an edge. Alternatively, if the density of the universe is low and not enough to halt the expansion, then space distorts in the opposite direction. This results in an open universe with negative curvature that resembles a saddle. You know, like on a horse. Despite these two potential scenarios, most scientists agree that the density of the universe is just right. Which means it expands proportionally without curving. But what does it mean if the universe is flat? It doesn't mean we're living in an infinite sheet of paper. To understand it, consider these analogies. Imagine you're in a square room, walk 10 steps to the next corner, make a 90-degree turn, walk another 10 steps, and repeat this process twice more. You end up back at your starting point, completing a square. Add another dimension to this geometry, since we're not 2D creatures, and whoopee, you have a flat universe. This analogy wouldn't hold up in a curved space. If you have a terrestrial globe at home, you might find it easier to understand this next experiment. Start by placing your finger at the Earth's equator then trace a line to the North Pole, make a 90-degree turn, and return to the equator. Make one more 90-degree turn and walk back to your starting point. This journey only needed three turns, unlike the four turns in the flat universe scenario. Still struggling to understand? Here's another way to picture it. In a flat universe, two rockets traveling side by side will always remain parallel. This is in contrast to a closed universe where the rockets will travel along the curve of space and eventually meet where they started. In an open universe with negative curvature, the rockets will gradually drift apart and never cross paths again. So is there a cosmological crisis at hand? It seems the answer to the shape of our universe is encoded in the cosmic microwave background, also named CMB, which is like the universe's fossil record. Over the past few decades, scientists have measured temperature fluctuations in the CMB to find almost no curvature, indicating a flat universe. Now, The concept of a flat universe is crucial to the standard cosmological model. However, in late 2019, scientists from a university in Rome published a paper arguing that current CMB measurements actually indicate we're really living in a closed universe. How did they figure this out? Well, they looked at how light behaves in the universe. Specifically, they analyzed how light bends because of the gravitational force of matter in its path. Either way, apart from this finding, there's nothing else that would suggest we're living in a closed universe. Most scientists believe this recent discovery is nothing more than a statistical anomaly. But if the closed universe theory turns out to be right, it would shift decades of astronomical findings. If the universe is indeed curved, it must be so large that the observable 93 billion light years aren't enough to reveal its curvature. It could be similar to standing in a fog, only able to see a small flat patch of land, 
Yet somewhere out of sight, the horizon reveals that we live on a sphere. As we continue to probe the cosmos, we might find that the apparent flatness of our universe is just a small part of a much larger, curved cosmos. Its shape is just one of the many things we've yet to figure out about the universe. We can't quite put our finger on why the universe is even here, for instance. We do have some theories, but scientists are yet to be sure. It could be that the universe is like a pop-up, materializing out of an unstable nowhere land. Imagine the emptiest emptiness you can think of, suddenly turning out matter and energy in equal and opposite amounts that tally up to zero. For most of us, it's hard to picture that process. If we follow this theory, who's to say there's only one universe? We might be just one of an enormous collection, a so-called multiverse. For now, we'll just have to wait for the next wave of cosmic measurements to refine our theories. And for scientists to come up with hypotheses that aren't just mathematically pretty, but actually testable. Also. How could we possibly know all the secrets of the universe if we don't completely understand our own biology yet? I mean, if we did, we could, theoretically, solve all of our health problems, right? We might even be able to play around with our DNA, like this molecular Lego, and give ourselves naturally purple hair or red fingernails. Well, time for a reality check, as we're still struggling with this one too. Here's a great example, our microbiome. Our bodies, home to 10 trillion human cells, are also an active city for 100 trillion microbial cells. That's a couple of pounds of bacteria and other microbes, which we absolutely can't do without. They've set up shop in our bellies, lungs, noses, and every other hidden nook and cranny. We're like luxurious cruise ships for these tiny microbial tourists, and we still don't fully understand the implications of this symbiotic relationship. There are still a lot of things we don't know about planet Earth, either. We've only ever dipped our toes into Earth's crust, never venturing more than a few miles deep. Everything else is our best guess, from remote sensing and smart physics. Believe it or not, it took us an embarrassingly long time to accept that the Earth's crust is constantly shifting, like Jenga pieces. We only warmed up to plate tectonics in the mid-20th century. We're also still trying to figure out precisely how the planet's inner engine works, and how the swirling conducting materials in the outer core create our protective magnetic field. Plus, with 4.5 billion years of geological chaos, we're sometimes better off studying meteorites or the surfaces of other celestial bodies for clues about our planet's history. Even our faithful companion, the Moon, is a bit of a mystery. Was it born from a colossal collision or some other event? We're still not sure. But hey, the fact that we still have a lot to learn is what makes life interesting, isn't it? That, and the thrill of actually finding an empty parking spot in San Francisco. Or maybe even your city. Black holes tearing apart enormous stars, pulsars spinning at incredible speeds and emitting powerful beams of energy, colorful nebulae with fireworks of newborn stars, galaxies of every possible color and size. All of these are found within our universe. But it's not infinite. It has a boundary, a literal wall. And beyond that, there's an absolute nothingness. Right now, we're going to make a journey to that wall. But first things first, our universe is like a humongous nesting doll. If you open it up, there's a smaller one inside. It's a galaxy. Inside that is an even smaller doll. That's our solar system. And the smallest doll of all is the Earth. Each of these dolls has boundaries that we are going to cross. For that, we'll need a spaceship and a big one. It also has to be able to move a hundred times faster than the speed of light. You get on board and start the engines. 62 miles above sea level is our first boundary. That's 10 times higher than passenger planes fly. This point is called the Kármán line. It separates the atmosphere of the Earth from outer space. Now we fly further to the edge of our solar system. We turn on the hyperdrives and fly past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We've traveled a distance of 100 astronomical units. 
One AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. And here's the boundary of our solar system, the heliosphere. Here, the speed of the solar wind decreases rapidly. First, it drops from 620,000 miles per hour to the speed of sound. Then, there's a layer called the heliopause. This is where the wind almost vanishes. And then, our ship experiences a bow wave. This is where we feel the force of the interstellar wind, which collides with the boundary of our solar system. When you pass this boundary, you find yourself in the dark of interstellar space. And here, you can find two human-made objects that made this trip for the first time in history. They're Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 crossed that boundary in 2004. Voyager 2 did it in 2007. These space probes discovered that the heliosphere is not a perfect ball around the sun. Its southern boundary is 10 AUs closer to the star than the northern one. So, we're moving in interstellar space and will soon approach a stone wall around our solar system. 200,000 AUs further, and there it is. This wall of rock is the Oort cloud. In fact, it's a pile of asteroids that surround our world. Scientists speculate that the Oort cloud could be the source of comets and meteorites that fall to Earth, but they're so sparse that we easily fly between them. Now we're in complete darkness. The Milky Way is about 106,000 light years wide. In a conventional rocket, it would take billions of years to fly across that distance. But you throttle to the max. You masterfully fly past the stars and planets as if on a racetrack. And within minutes, you're at the edge of our galaxy. There's no more interstellar wind. All you see are bright dots somewhere in the distance. These dots are huge galaxies. We need to look at a map to make a route to the edge of our entire universe. You're here, near the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a cluster of galaxies called the Linnea Kea Supercluster. But even this huge thing is like a little street in a big city. Zooming out, we find Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. Thousands of galaxies on the map look like little dots. Maximum zoom out! This is our entire observable universe. We thought it was infinite, but we may have proof that it has a boundary. It's here, 10 billion light years away from our home. Even if you travel at the speed of light, a trip there would take twice as long as our whole planet has existed. During that time, the sun will either fade away or explode like a supernova, destroying our entire solar system. And if you can live that long and then return home, you will see that our galaxy is there no more. It's long since collided with the Andromeda galaxy and merged into one big cosmic body. Luckily. Your ship is able to warp space-time so that this journey will literally take a few seconds. Boom! Congratulations! You've arrived at your destination, the Eridanus Supervoid. Some scientists believe this location is the evidence of collisions of our universe with something big enough to leave such a large scar. The Eridanus Supervoid is an empty and cold space one billion light-years wide. If you think of this void as a cup, it would fit at least 10,000 galaxies. And it appeared after an accident of gigantic proportions. The object that crashed into our universe was... Another universe! Yes, other universes may actually exist. Imagine that our entire universe is a huge bubble that contains all the clusters of galaxies in the observable universe. There could be an infinite number of such bubbles. They could have been born during the Big Bang. These universes may be different from ours. They may have other galaxies and nebulae. But these bubbles could also be parallel universes. This means that if you chose cereal over oatmeal in the morning, in another universe, your twin would choose the oatmeal. Every choice you ever made in life had completely different consequences in a parallel universe. And because the number of choices are infinite, there's a whole infinity of parallel universes. So, like a regular bubble, our universe has a wall that is near the Eridanus supervoid. Long ago, another bubble flew past ours. As they approached each other, their gravitational fields began to interact. Our boundary wall began to deform and pull toward the other universe. The same thing happened on the other side. Then the walls of our universes came into contact. But as these bubbles moved, their connection began to break. And the other universe just ripped a huge chunk of ours. A cold void was formed at the point of collision, and that was the Eridanus supervoid. The problem is that the universe looks the same to the observer, regardless of point of view. For example, imagine a basketball hanging in the air. 
Now, if we put an ant on the ball and tell it to find the edge of the ball, it will start running around it, making an infinite number of circles. But the landscape around the ant will not change. All it will see is a rounded horizon. That's because the ball remains the same from any point of view. The same thing happens to us when we try to find the edge of our universe, all because we imagine the world in three-dimensional space, and our view is limited. For example, you see an ordinary square in two-dimensional space. But if you add depth and change the point of view, voila, it's a cube. If we could see the universe in four-dimensional space, a square might be something completely different. But maybe we can leave our home bubble. The key to traveling to another universe might be inside a black hole. A black hole is one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy, they warp not only space, but time as well. It's like putting a heavy boulder on a net. The net will sag, and the closer you get to the boulder, the stronger the curvature is. Once you're in the gravitational field of a black hole, you can't leave it. We still don't know what might actually be in the heart of a black hole. Some scientists speculate that white holes also exist. Theoretically, they should be born along with black holes. Except for the color, they're the exact opposite of black holes. Nothing can come close to a white hole. At the moment, there's no data on such objects, but general relativity theory suggests they do exist. There's also a theory that a black hole may be a passage to another universe. When you get into a black hole, you can come out the other side through the event horizon of the white hole. So you bypass the boundary of the universes and find yourself in a completely different world. But we may have proof that a white hole exists. In 2006, scientists discovered an unusual burst of energy somewhere 1.6 billion light years away from Earth. This burst was unique. It didn't look like a supernova explosion or even the merger of two black holes. Some astronomers believe it was the birth of a white hole. But because it was unstable, it was destroyed almost immediately. This process was reminiscent of the birth of our entire universe, the Big Bang. So scientists called it the Little Bang. The sun's heat is beneath our feet. Scientists have figured out that Earth's core is actually as hot as the surface of the sun, around 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the reasons it's so incredibly hot down there is because Earth is still shedding heat from when it was created billions of years ago. Also, when an object as big as Mars slammed into the young Earth, it not only created the moon, according to one theory, but melted the surface of the planet. A lot of that extra heat is probably still stored inside the core. But there's no need to worry. The planet's core is harder for us to access than it is to probe the surface of Pluto. In fact, chances are we may never develop technology that could physically reach the core. There's no air on the moon. But then, how can it be rusting? Scientists have discovered the presence of hermatite on the moon, and it's a kind of rust. A special NASA research instrument examined the light reflected off the moon's surface. It turned out that the composition of the satellite's poles was very different from the rest of it. The moon's surface is dotted with iron-rich rocks. But without oxygen and liquid water, rust can't appear. Solar winds add to the mystery. They bombard the moon with hydrogen. And hydrogen makes it much more difficult for hematite to form. Even though the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it still has some trace amounts of oxygen. Its source is our planet's upper atmosphere. Earth also protects the moon from almost 100% of solar winds, although not all the time. And even though our natural satellite is bone dry, there might be water ice in the shadowed craters on its far side. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds, but Get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart, and it will likely result in the formation of a ring around the planet. The Earth is the densest in the solar system, 
At the Earth's center, there's a core that takes up 15% of the planet's volume. It consists of two parts, the outer and the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles, which makes 20% of the entire Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's radius. The 1,500-mile-thick outer core is liquid. It also consists of iron and nickel, but it's not under enough pressure to be solid. Mars houses the biggest volcano in the solar system. While everything seems to be calm on Mars nowadays, in the past, some sort of force caused enormous volcanoes to form and erupt. One of these volcanoes is Olympus Mons. It's 16 miles tall, which is the height of three Mount Everests and 374 miles across, making it about the size of Arizona. The volcano grew to such a gargantuan size because of the weak gravity on Mars and the lack of tectonic plate movement. Gravity is not the same everywhere. The rocks, metals, and other minerals and substances that make up the planet are packed into the ground more tightly in certain places than in others. This has surprising consequences. Gravity varies slightly depending on where you are. You weigh 0.5% less standing at the equator than you do at the poles. In most cases, that's a difference of less than one pound. How high up you are also has an effect. So if you were at the top of Mount Everest, you'd also weigh slightly less. Just don't look down. Earth's toughest living thing is so small you can't see it. Water bears, also known as moss piglets, are cute little creatures with eight legs and squashed up heads that are less than a hundredth of an inch in length. Despite their microscopic stature, they can basically survive anywhere. They prefer bits of wet moss or the bottom of a lake, but they won't complain if you put them somewhere really uncomfortable. They can endure extreme cold and incredible heat and survive both huge pressure and high radiation. Some of the little bears once even managed to survive unprotected in outer space for 10 days without a problem. <laughs> that is tough. They handle all these things by rolling up into a ball and hibernating, which reduces their need for oxygen and food. The moon's gravity is about 17% of that on Earth. If you weighed 200 pounds on our home planet, on the moon, your weight would decrease to a mere 34 pounds. You would also be able to carry stuff six times heavier than what you can carry on Earth. It would also be easier to walk on the moon's surface, but it would be more dangerous too. Your feet, inside a heavy spacesuit, would sink into the lunar soil up to six inches deep. But let's imagine you decided to skip the tedious process of walking by leaping through the air. Then you'd likely lose control of your jumps in no time. Plus, the moon's surface is littered with deep craters. It would be a tough feat to avoid all of them. You can see solar eclipses because even though the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, it's also 400 times closer to Earth. So it's perfectly capable of obscuring the star. But in 50 million years, I won't be around then. The moon won't be able to block the sun completely because of the satellite's changing orbit. A full NASA spacesuit costs an unbelievable $12 million. Yeah, I can believe that. 70% of this hefty sum is for the control module and backpack. At the very center of Uranus, there's a rocky core. Small, just half the Earth's mass. Compared to other planets, Uranus's core is rather cool, 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. An ice mantle surrounds the solid core, and that's the largest portion of the planet, about 80%. It's also not the ice you might be thinking about. It's a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia, ice, and methane, sometimes referred to as a water ammonia ocean. Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but it has its blue-green color because of methane gas that absorbs the red light. The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other in the solar system. But unlike Earth's oceans, it's made not of water, but of metallic hydrogen. The ocean's depth is a mind-blowing 25,000 miles. That's almost the same as the distance around Earth. Venus is a champ when it comes to volcanoes. The planet has about 1,600 major ones, but none of them is known to erupt. 
There's a supermassive black hole 250 million light years away from us. It hums the deepest sound ever detected from any object in the universe. It's 57 octaves lower than the middle C on your piano. That's one quadrillion times deeper than what we can hear. Mercury is a few billion years old. In 2016, scientists discovered some abnormalities on the planet's surface, showing that it's getting smaller. After more research, they found out that Mercury hadn't finished cooling down yet. There are planets that aren't bound to any star orbit and aimlessly wander through outer space. Among the most spectacular looking space objects are pulsars. Pulsars are a type of neutron star. They shoot out some of their material almost at the speed of light. Regular pulsars spin at a reasonable speed, between one-tenth to sixty times per second. But millisecond pulsars can spin at an impressive 700 times a second, which is way too fast for the human eye to even process. As they spin, they emit a beam of radiation from their axis that looks like the light from a lighthouse. Astronomers can notice pulsars when they face Earth, since it looks like a light being shined on our planet. When the light shines elsewhere, the pulsar can't be seen. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. Saturn's rings are very thin compared to its size. If you had a scale model of the planet that was three feet wide, the rings would be 10,000 times thinner than a razor blade. Even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow, but not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. Not a great vacation spot. 